You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. We have Matt Sell. Um, He's part of Maryland Wildlife Resources. Uh, What part of it do you manage? I am the Western Region 1 Fisheries Manager. So that includes Garrett and Allegheny counties. Yeah, And then congratulations, because off camera, we talked about this is your one year anniversary, right? Yeah, Thursday. I've been at it for a year. That's freaking awesome. That's really, yeah, really cool. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I talked to Matt a little bit. Uh, I had David Sikorsky on. He helps out with the Chesapeake Bay Association. He got me in contact with you. And then so, and I was talking to John and, and through the grapevine, we're able to make this work here, which is really awesome because, you know, being able to collaborate with the different DNRs is so important because they're the ones at the boots on the ground. They're the ones that can make really the big adjustments. And so being able to hear it from you guys and pass that information on to everyone else, I think is so vital to have that open communication. Um, what, I mean, we talked about this a little bit before we got started here. What got you into this? <laughs> well, um, I guess where it all began when I was a kid, I just, I grew up in South Central Pennsylvania and in the heart of some pretty, pretty solid trout fishing. And I was a trout bum. And from early on, I loved going out fishing streams for trout. And, um, I was fortunate that I had a family that really supported that along the way. Uh, I spent a lot of time trout fishing whenever I was younger. And I had a grandfather who was retired and was more than happy at any time to drive me out, drop me off, pick me up and fish with me at times um, that really kind of fostered that love of not just trout fishing, but the outdoors. Now, in addition to that, I've I've been a hunting and fishing guy since I was old enough to know what hunting and fishing were, really. Mm-hmm. But as that kind of progressed, you know, I I had this love of trout fishing and this love of fishing in general. And I started to expand as I got older and, and my dad and I would, would go to small lakes. We had a little John boat we'd throw in the back of the truck. I can still remember having to steal truck batteries because we ran the the deep cycle (laughs) dead. Um, but it kind of expanded into a love for all fishing, uh, to the point where it became an obsession. My wife then girlfriend uh referred to fishing as the f word um and it yeah it i was obsessed i I really was and i my senior year of high school i was i I fished over 300 days that year so it was um i had made it my life and then we were met with uh, this i guess we'll call it an opportunity in high school where they decided we should do a career project. Mm. And the advice that we were given was, well, find something you like to do, get somebody to pay you to do it. And I, I, I won't give away my age, but the internet was still budding at the time. And despite my best chance to find the end of it, I couldn't find too many jobs outside of being a professional bass angler that would pay me to go fishing. So I started to look into the fisheries management end of things. And it always intrigued me that there are people out there that get paid to catch fish, measure fish, weigh fish, use that information to make fishing better. And that kind of stuck with me. And that was, that was kind of what my career project focused on was more the fisheries management side of things. And that's really, that's where it it got started is it, it, it got me thinking that way as a career and again, I, I had a family that was very supportive. Um, you know, I, I did okay in school. I mean, I, I certainly there are a lot higher paying jobs that I that I could have pursued. Mm-hmm. And I, I got to think that my my parents were probably cringing a bit when I said, "Hey, I want to be a fisheries biologist." And they're thinking, "Oh, you know, if you find a job, you're going to be living in Alaska or something like that." And, um, but they they supported it. And I ended up going to Frostburg State, got a degree there and started my graduate work. Never finished my graduate work, unfortunately, because I got a job, got married, started life. And um, the job that I got was starting to work in the fisheries field. And from there, it just grew. I started as um, working with a program within Maryland DNR that does stream survey work. And I started as a technician, 
went on to be a crew leader for for a few years and uh in the process i got to meet my previous supervisor alan heft uh who was kind of a one-man show at the time mm. working on cold water uh cold water management in maryland and we had a um we had an opportunity arise for a few new positions that were offered one of which was brook trout specialist and the uh the brook trout specialist position you know i was fortunate to be given the opportunity to to take that on now how so you just talked about like you fish for trout 300 days a year like how the, was that just like a right place right time to go from like i fish for trout my whole life to like i get to now work with brook trout or did you help facilitate that like i don't know is it like a career day there where it's like i this is the route i want to go no it, it was certainly the route i wanted to go was find a job that i didn't have to live in alaska <laughs> that was the route that i wanted and um right place right time does not even begin to touch how fortunate i was um yeah i believe in hard work and i worked very hard at every position i had and certainly those kinds of things go noticed um and whenever opportunities do arise mm -hmm. then you're you know you've cast a favorable light on yourself because you've worked so hard you have volunteered you know, you've done all the extra stuff to put yourself in positions. And the fact that there was a trout position that happened to open up at a time that I was looking for a position. That's yeah. It's the, the odds were certainly astronomical. Um, I fully expected that I was not going to be living in the South Central Pennsylvania, Western Maryland, even the mid Atlantic, I figured I would be fortunate to stay within two or three States. It's meant to be. Yeah. And, and that's, that's it. I, I certainly believe that along the way, there are a lot of things that are just meant to be. And in that case, yeah, I, I think it was a perfect example for kids at home that, that have that passion in their belly to be in the outdoors, to maybe work in, in the fish department. Um, you started at Frostburg and you got your bachelor's degree, I'm assuming, and then you go straight to master's, then doctoral work, or how does that, that whole, Go there on. there's a progression there generally speaking um you're going to want to get at least a master's degree okay and that um for a lot of positions especially even entry level positions there's an increasing i guess the the basic standards are getting higher the academic bar is raising yes yeah that's a better way to put it i'm i'm no wordsmith <laughs> um it uh so certainly expect that if you want to get into fisheries management that you're going to need to get a four-year degree and likely you're going to going to need to get some sort of you know postgraduate type degree my experience has been to go all the way to the phd level you generally and I, this isn't across the board and, and i'm sorry for any phds out there that have fisheries management positions um you generally end up more in research in mm. academia than you do in applied fisheries management. If you have a love of fishing and you want to make fishing better and you want to go out and collect data to improve fishery resources for anglers, then, you know, you're more of a fish management person than just a pure research person. It's applied research is what it really boils down okay, to. Okay. Gotcha. So, yeah. yeah, that's so it's because, again, like that's so important for people to understand, like the process of getting into this, not just to be able to better understand what you do. But then again, it, it is also a route to go for a lot of kids that think, well, the only way I, I can get into this is if I'm a pro bass fisherman mm -hmm. or I'm a YouTuber or something like that. But there's a whole other way that you can attack this um, yeah. specifically. Um, and then and to put a pin on that, like, did you have to do a, a specific degree to actually go that route or did you get like a gener a generic biology degree or did you get more specialized yeah see frostburg offers a wildlife and fisheries degree um you can do both i chose to stick to the fisheries management tract which it because of the way the the program and the syllabus is structured i had a little extra leeway where i moved more into the geography realm Oh, okay. and ended up with a minor in uh, geography uh, and really focused on geographic information systems, which mm. is kind of a spatial analysis type software. Why did you do that? Why? Um, I was given that advice by, by a professor at Frostburg that I very, he was, I very much respected him. And he said, listen, 
this is this is a budding science. Again, I say budding science. It's almost second nature now for for folks, but I'm showing my age. Um, he's, he said that the applications for this in natural resource field are infinite, just about, and you need to do this. And it started with the introductory course to an advanced course to a further advanced course. And I also, because of the fact that I'm wanting to work with fish, I wanted to better understand hydrology. So I picked up some surface water, groundwater hydrology classes. That's and okay. yeah, I mean, actually, there was a point where I sort of considered maybe changing majors because really? I really enjoyed geography mm -hmm. and I saw the applications of all this. But the, the fish had too strong a hold on me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was hooked. Yeah, that that, that no definitely. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But I mean, so because it's so crazy to talk about like the uh, raising the bar of education. And it, it is important that nowadays kids do specialize and they know that they're going into it, that, yeah, you, you might need a Ph.D. for better or worse or, you know, you do need to specialize into it. Um, are, are there internship programs that that kids should know about with Maryland? Um, how would they get in that? And guys, everything we talk about would be lim linked in the episode description so you can find this information. Yeah, certainly th there are internship opportunities. We have seasonal type positions that we offer. Some divisions, some groups have more opportunities that way than others. Um, you know, it, it's going to vary year to year. The best thing you can do is, is keep your thumb on the pulse of it as okay. you're looking for, you know, summer internship type opportunities. Check out our website. Uh, we'll have that kind of stuff listed. And um yeah, that's that's a big one is try to get your foot in the door that way. And it's networking. You know, if you want to work in Maryland and you can get an internship in Maryland, you're going to get to know the people in Maryland and they're going to know you. Mm. Um, and networking, whether it's fisheries or accounting or any profession, uh, networking is a big deal. And um, so if you know where uh, around about where you want to be in the world and maybe what you want to do specifically, uh, if there's particular species you want to work with or just a, a you know, freshwater fisheries or tidal fisheries or, or whatever. Um, don't be afraid to volunteer. Mm -hmm. And that's a big one too, that there aren't always paid opportunities out there. Uh, we have budgets and budgets allow us to do certain things. And sometimes that would include hiring seasonal help. Other times it doesn't. And I get half dozen people on an annual basis reach out to me via email saying, hey, if there's anything I can do, I'd love to come out. I'd love to volunteer. And this is a career path that I see myself on. And that that type of that type of experience is valuable as well i mean certainly you're not taking home a paycheck but at the end of the day uh, it gives you the opportunity to learn gives you the opportunity to network and you can put that stuff on your resume as experience then. It, it circles back to like like you said like putting in the work and working hard and, yeah. and that's something i think there's a lot of kids now in this generation that don't quite understand that it's not all given to you. you actually have to go out and reach for it. And then if you know those opportunities exist, if you know where to, to look, then you do have to like, all right, roll up your sleeves if you want to get into it. Yep. Um, and, and, you know, with, with that said, you know, you put a lot of everyone that I've talked to that's a field biologist, like you guys aren't sitting behind a desk. I've never met an overweight biologist. I mean, like what for a lot of individuals that don't understand when you're saying you're taking samples and stuff, like how much, if you had to break down the percentage, how many of your days are spent actually behind a desk compared to out in the field? Well, since I got my, my my promotion last year, a few more days at the desk than, than what I like. I'd certainly love to be out there, but our field season is going to start depending on the, depending on the objectives that we have for the given year. Uh, typically our field season is going to start in March and it's going to start to wind down about September, October, uh, September. Usually we're, we're getting pretty well finished up with some of our, uh, some of our larger river type surveys and things. So, uh, that said, there's always, always the chance that you could be out there during the other times of the year. For instance, um, the Northern Pike research we did on Deep Creek, uh, I was doing an angler preference survey about that to kind of get a feel for 
angler attitudes towards the pike fishery in Deep Creek. And part of that was riding around with natural resources police on a snowmobile in the wintertime. That was pretty cool, you know, actually. Doing interviews on the ice. Oh, yeah, it was awesome. You know, running around on a snowmobile talking to anglers. I love talking to anglers and I love getting that feedback and the opportunity to, to really get out there and, and cruise around on the lake. That's, it's a cool deal. So, uh, yeah, that's, yeah. that's actually, that's a pretty good perk, perk of the job. Um, and, and, you know, and, and getting back to, to you were actually with the, with the brook trout, um, how, what was your day in and day out like responsibilities with, with the brook trout specifically and, and why just the brook trout? Do they actually sectionalize it off to more to where it is brook trout, the rainbows, tigers, um, browns? Like mm -hmm. how does all that work? Okay. Yeah. It, my supervisor, then supervisor, Alan Heft, uh, he's since retired. Um, he was more of the statewide cold water person that, you know, largely dealt more with all species of trout. But uh, my position as brook trout specialist was a position that was approved um, to really tackle the management of that resource because brook trout being our only native sound wanted here in, well, in Maryland and in the mid-Atlantic, uh, short of Atlantic salmon, which mm -hmm. there are a few of those through some stocking efforts still oh. available out and about, but uh, not in Maryland, mind you. But um, there's a strong conservation movement for brook trout right now. And that's kind of why my position arose. And a lot of the, I guess you talk about the day in and day out of that position. Uh, it started with, you know, basically we had written a brook trout management plan in 2006 and there was what information was available at the time in that plan. But we also recognized that there are a lot of things we don't know. And with the focus on brook trout, both at the academic and research level, as well as the grassroots conservation level, the angling level, it, there was a lot of focus on brook trout. Um, and, I stepped into it with a blank slate of, you know, where do we go? And we started off with one of the big projects that we tackled early on was where do we still have brook trout? So the first step was find out where all we have sampled brook trout, when were we in there last, what is the historical distribution, if you will. Uh, over the, I, I went back roughly, I guess it was 20 years or so, 25 years, gathered all the data that I could put together what we refer to as a historical distribution. And then over a five year period, we through both staff at the brook trout program level, as well as the regional level, um, we worked together to sample all of those historical populations over a five year period. Gotcha. 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 And that gave us what uh, we concluded that in 2018. And that gave us a, current distribution of brook trout in Maryland. And we noted declines in all of the management regions where brook trout still exist. Biggest declines being in the central part of the state, which is really the, the southernmost edge hmm. of Piedmont brook trout. That had to have given you an advantage that you did this for so freaking long as a kid, just your instinct with it versus someone that's never trout fished before. It's got to have helped a little. Yeah. Um, understanding why fish are where they are and, and how they are and what to expect, uh, glean some insight. But at the same time, there's, there's so much more that we can understand through survey work that you never understand as an angler, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, as we were joking about earlier, uh, before this podcast started, if we manage fisheries based upon my catch rate, we'd swear that there weren't any fish left in the world. Yeah. Well, how but, I'm fishing right now. Yeah. We'd be in trouble. Yeah. Right. Um, but, uh, <laughs> no, it, it certainly helped in that way. But, you know, the, the objective of those surveys is in as much of an unbiased way as possible, get a feel for what's out there, get a feel for the density, for the size distribution, get a feel for whether or not they're even there. And that's the that's where being an angler certainly would help and certainly did help me. And um, we do qualitative or quantitative surveys for the brook trout. And and when we do a qualitative survey, uh, we have a we have a standard operating procedure for how to do that, but it's more covering water 
to find whether fish are there. It's mm. more of an occupancy type survey where a quantitative survey is, you can probably guess, it's more quantifying how many fish are there. What is the size distribution? So in, in doing as qualitative surveys, knowing the habitats that trout like to be in certainly helped to be able to focus on those areas to be able to determine are they there or not. And uh, yeah, so that's that's kind of so. So John mentioned something um, and I'm, I, I won't be able to quote him like per so I'll go uh, to a range. But he said that it's like between three and 10 percent are actually natural waters in Maryland for trout um, that they, they can naturally reproduce in. And that's kind of a I'm going to say, guys, it's like a rough estimate. Go back and listen to it. Um, it what is the cold water? And, and again, this would be something good to elaborate on warm versus cold. What is the temperature? for that what are the trout waters like in maryland compared to your your, your home state of, of pa is there a greater abundance of, of cold water naturally producing habitat versus pa vice versa what, what is that like well it's, it's a matter of size um uh, maryland is referred to as america in miniature and hmm. you know from the mountains to the sea oh okay got so you. we are uh, we're a state that's stretched out mm -hmm. and we have coastline with the atlantic ocean we have uh, a very large estuary and we have the Appalachian Mountains and literally everything in between. So we can't, when talking about opportunity and, and amount of cold water habitat, certainly Pennsylvania has, I would, I don't have numbers, but I would say exponentially more just based upon the size and the fact that the Appalachian Mountains bisect the state and you have higher elevation, colder water in general across. Now, one thing that is to our advantage in Maryland is we were able to do that five-year survey of brook trout and really do a synoptic survey of the entire state where places like Pennsylvania, you know, again, we alluded to earlier about limitations with staff and we only have so many people. There's only so much we can do. Uh, Pennsylvania has been working on their it's a big state. Yeah. yeah, it's a huge state and they have an unassessed waters initiative, just trying to understand what is their baseline. Mm -hmm. And where are there trout out there on the landscape where we're, we're a little more fortunate that way, where we, we have a pretty, pretty good feel for where our trout waters are. So it would really be impossible to compare us to Pennsylvania, even if you made it a relative abundance of cold water resources, because Pennsylvania, they're so big, they don't even, I mean, they do a great job. Don't get me wrong. This isn't a, a, a crack on Pennsylvania in any way, but. You know, they don't even know where all they have trout resources. It's got to be easier, too, when you're dealing with a smaller state when it comes to doing supplemental stocking programs. Because I can't imagine like a, a, a Texas for bass or a Pennsylvania for trout. Like that is got to be insane to think logistically how you even even tackle that. Yeah. Do you have an issue? In the, and guys, this, I think this is very topical because of like we've had snakehead. We've had the catfish issues. I, do trout fishermen ever, do you have an issue with trout fishermen of them putting in um, non-native or, or, or fish species that you do not want to see in a certain creek like you see in the other tribes of fishermen? Because um, I don't really hear about that, but I'm also not in tune with those communities of, let's say, hey, they start transferring brown trout into a creek, you don't want them. Or is that something that really doesn't happen in, in the trout community? Yeah, uh, kind of that Johnny Appleseed mentality yeah. that I like brown trout, I'm going to move them into this, yeah. into this creek. Yeah. Um, I certainly don't see a lot of evidence that that happens by anglers. Um, you, for one, it's, it's illegal to do. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, it's difficult to move trout because there are cold water species and to just to th throw a trout in a bucket and haul them X number of miles to your favorite little stream. Um, it, it would be challenging. So I, I, I don't see that as, as much of an issue um yeah i just I, I don't see anglers i don't hear of anglers moving trout around like that I, I didn't hear about it either but it's so interesting how that's very unique to um certain tribes of anglers i mean you guys you know that's something i've coined is like you know everyone is tribal basically in this sport and you look at you know catfish i mean god love them i like it doing it too and snakehead anglers you know clearly and especially in virginia where we are there is mounting evidence that these two tribes like to um illegally transplant certain species and it's just unique it's so interesting that that's unique to those two groups versus other ones um i guess down in southern virginia we have an issue with, with spotted bass showing up for some reason we don't know how they showed up and now that's going to be an issue but it's so unique that trout fishermen seem to 
play nice, I guess they behave better with that stuff, which is, which is awesome. Um, and getting into trout season, like we are now, um, not giving away any, any juice, but if you wanted to take, um, a specifically a, a spin, a spin guy, he's trying to take his kids somewhere to go. Um, what are a couple of places that you think they can have success this year? Um, as trout season gets closer and you have a couple of baits that you think would work. Yeah, sure thing. Um, to start off with where to go, we have a number of put and take waters that get stocked in Maryland, mind you. I'm um, talking about Maryland. I know you're a more of a mid Atlantic yeah, uh, show, but, everywhere, but yeah. uh, I'm going to speak, speak uh, specifically to Maryland. We, we have fall stocking in a lot of our put and take waters that the really the best course of action for an angler that wants to go out and have a better probability of, of catching some fish, especially if you want to take some kids or whatever, uh, get on our website. And you can go to, um, there's a trout stocking uh, section on the website that you can check out. Uh, we publish the, the uh, stocking records where we're putting fish. And uh, that's a good place to start to know kind of where to go. We also have our angler access map that shows those put and take waters. It's an interactive map. You can click on it. It'll tell you what type of management is, where you have trout, that sort of thing. Um, and again, guys, all this will be linked in the episode description. So just go down there, whether you're on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, and you can click on it. So you'll be able to find these waters. Cause that's the one thing that, that I know I get asked a lot in the comment section. And then also when people come into the store here, it's like, where can we go to actually, you know, have success. And then, mm -hmm. and I guess you will be also advertising when the stocking takes place. So people can have access to that as well. Yep. Yeah. Like I say, angler access map and the stock, the published stocking, um, is going to get you pointed in the right direction for put and take opportunities. If you want more of a wild trout opportunity, certainly there's, there's a number of those out there and that's where um, you're welcome to share my contact information uh, at some point somewhere in, in the program, but uh, feel free to call me at the office. If you were, if you're sure about that, <laughs> shoot, shoot me. it's publicly available, uh, that's true. Okay, uh, you yeah. know, I, and I do, we get plenty of phone calls. Uh, whenever it comes to especially spring trout season uh really? generally spring trout season versus fall that's interesting yeah yeah spring spring is far more popular huh. than fall um more fish get stocked hmm. it's the it's the traditional trout opener um okay. that yeah spring is certainly more popular in maryland for trout fishing than than the fall i'm not saying there aren't plenty of people that fish the fall but yeah um that um that's that's certainly the case and baits what what as a spin guy yourself growing up what what are some things that people uh people can use yeah um light tackle so start with rod reel setup light tackle six pound four pound test mono monofilament it, you know very simple it doesn't have to be expensive it doesn't have to be top shelf um lore wise uh if, if you're looking artificials mm -hmm. i was always an inline spinner um and i i mean i, I grabbed a couple yeah here. Just, I, you just hold up to the camera and i can i can deal okay. that post edit um i started on rooster tails uh i i quickly quickly had a impact on my parents checking account by the number of rooster tails that i would lose uh when you're fishing as as hard as what i was you, you get hung up a lot you lose a lot mm -hmm. um so i started building my own spinners my my dad bought all the lure making equipment that i needed and we could build them for a fraction of the cost and you know i it, things that are are more along the lines of like a, a cp swing um just a couple of brass beads uh, i like french blades i didn't see any french blades on the shelf over here hmm. they they tend to spin a little easier but that played well with my approach to it which um you think about how a trout is built how any fish is built that's going to live in a river or stream okay they're built to face upstream it's it's physics uh turn it if you don't believe me next time you catch a trout try to hold them in the current facing the wrong way tail forward and they just don't work there's, just, there's a reason why airplanes are designed the way they are trout are going to be facing upstream so i was taught at a young age to fish downstream because it's easier to work the lure yeah. man you can feel that blade spinning on the inline spinner it's you know you're fishing effectively so for people that don't know casting downstream and pulling it upstream yes yeah. yes um 
but whenever I, the light bulb moment, I guess, I, I don't know when it was, but at some point I got to thinking about it and thought, well, wait a second. If these fish see me, they're not as likely to bite. They're going to be put down. They're going to be spooked for a certain period of time, a period of time that I'm not going to be standing there mm -hmm. and trying to catch them. So I, <laughs> I just turned around and started fishing upstream. And that's where having the French blades versus more of a willow type blade, French blades drag a little harder and you mm. can get a little better action out of the inline spinner, pulling it with the current. Huh. But the advantage there is that you can sneak up behind the fish. Mm -hmm. You can get closer to the fish. You can make more accurate casts because you can get closer. And, um, you know, couple that with, it doesn't have to be camouflage, but don't wear a blaze orange shirt. You know, uh, th think about it. You're trying to hide from the fish. Uh, concealment's a big deal, uh, especially if you're fishing for wild fish. That, do, you think, do you think trout have better eyesight than deer? I have no idea because I would think like it, it, I just the reason it popped up is like you can you still wear blaze orange when you're when you're deer hunting and it doesn't always seem to be an issue. Mm -hmm. But with trout, you know, you're right. Like even when I try to trout fish as a kid, those they're like turkey almost like they can. I don't know if it's just because of just if you're hitting the water or something else, but they're always looking. Um, and we were at ICAST and so crazy. This one guy talked about how he, he swears that, that trout will, can almost see shadows. Mm -hmm. Like if a leaf's in the water, it'll, it, it will react to the shadow. The leaf will put off in the water column. Oh yeah. I, I would say that I would agree with that a hundred percent. I've, I've had situations where I, I have had, I've put fish down because of a shadow that I put on the water and mm -hmm. I, I would approach as I, advanced in my trout fishing and started targeting particular trophy size fish. I would find a fish and then just fish for it, like hunt for that fish. And m my approach to that fish became as important as, as the presentation really. And you know, that they're, those fish are being, I guess they're being subject to predation their entire life. Mm -hmm. And it's about survival and reproduction and growth. You know, that that's basically a fish's life <laughs> in a nutshell. And survival is a big part of it because you don't get to reproduce or grow if you're dead. Um, yeah. yeah. So, so pretty straightforward. Um, <laughs> they become very good <laughs> at evading predators or they be they become food. How long do you have to let a place sit before you can go back? Let's say if you spook if you spook one, how long is there is there a rule of thumb that you usually implement? Depends on depends on the fish. Um certainly wild fish are a little cagier than stocked hatchery trout are hmm. um, adults. That is, you know, we stock fingerlings in our put and grow waters that by the time they reach adulthood there, they, they look, act and behave like a wild fish. But um, to answer your question, thinking about wild fish or targeting a particular fish, if I put that fish down, I'll leave them, I'll let them go. I won't fish them again that day. Oh, wow. And I would, in the case, again, it, this is getting into more of a specialized approach to trout fishing yeah. where I was targeting these big fish uh, because I was, I fished a lot of small streams. So I would fish mm. for fun until I found a big one. And then I would focus on that big one. And I would let, I would let that fish rest for days at a time before I'd go back and hit it again. Let them completely. Dude, wipe that's the insane. Sleep yeah. My God. It, it's one of those things where I just wanted to be sure that the next time I went back that they had no memory of as much as a fish can have memory. Are they territorial big trout? They can be, uh, definitely during, during spawning time and the larger they get, they'll occupy the more prime locations, the prime habitats and, and cover. And, you know, when you're talking and thinking about like brown trout, for instance, the 22 to 24 inch brown trout, pretty formidable uh to any of those eight or ten inch yeah, yeah. trout that, that want to maybe move into that area um so yeah certainly they can occupy more prime habitats but uh but they also will move around i've caught some of the biggest trout of my life in in some pretty darn skinny water hmm. so that's really cool yeah um one, one thing on, on on an inline spinner is there anything you have to do because of the line twist because i know when i when i would use them as a kid that was a pain in the ass was was the amount of line spin did you do anything different to to fix that or how would you alleviate that um i replace my line a lot 
Okay, or that. <laughs> yeah. I I was never a fan of any sort of barrel swivels or really? snap swivels. Um, I didn't. It was more more there. It was adding to the lure with something that didn't add to the presentation. So I always like to tie directly to. And that's where I just fished mono and it would get to the point where it would start to twist up. Uh, early on, the less it, the better quality gear, you have roller bearings and in, in your bail, things of that nature that help to reduce that line twist certainly helps. But um, no, I replaced a lot of line. Yeah, yeah. I, I would figure like I, some people like to I, I've heard use a swivel, but I didn't know if like that was like a standard procedure to use with them or, or not. It, a lot of folks do. And certainly will probably be plenty of comments uh, yeah. for this saying, well, you don't know what you're talking about. I've caught and, and hey, that may be the case. That's my personal preference. Um, I just if, if something if something in my presentation, the, the way that I attach that to my line doesn't add to it in a very positive way. I try to avoid it. It's just my approach, at least with trout. And and speaking of like presentations of this, this is, I guess the best segue to, to the lakes. And, um, one of the most unique fisheries that I didn't even know about, which is the pike. And I think, um, cause you talk about being very like unique and specific where you have to have specific gear when you're, when you're targeting the toothy guys, whether it's a musky or a pike, um, it's very important to specialize and, and, and guys don't worry, we'll get to that specifically here in a second, but, but really talk about the history of the pike population in deep Creek and how all that went about. Yeah. Um, they've been there for as long as, as long as I have known. Um, it is a fishery that has always, I guess, flown under the radar a little bit mm -hmm. that folks always kind of know they're there. But what's really interesting and unique about that particular fishery is we're pretty far south in the, in the Pikes Range. We're actually, Deep Creek is just, if you look at a range map, it's just outside of the southern edge of a Pikes Range. And down here, we're not really known for growing big pike. Canada, Alaska, those are places that you think about when you think of, you know, targeting those 40 plus inch type fish. Hmm. Um, there are a lot of smaller referred to as hammer handle pike populations uh this far south where you have an abundance of pike but rarely do you see one more than two feet long uh 30 inches would be a, a good fish where deep creek on the other hand we've been we had been getting you've you've heard the anecdotal uh angler reports that mm -hmm. hey i caught this big fish i saw this big fish um they consistently would show up and it it's it's one of those situations where the surveys that we were doing were fish community type surveys and they didn't they didn't always happen at a time or a place that pike would be because of the fact that we're so far south these pike have a pretty seasonal movement to them and will occupy different areas at different times so and Going at the um at the at the screen we got there to, to your right and, and you look at that, what what are really for people that want to actually target these guys, what are the seasonal movements and stuff of these creatures? I mean, and again, you know, let's go like just basic information for people that want to target them. You know, guys, as this episode drops, you know, we're 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 in mid-October now, going into ice out, fall into ice out. Like what what generally are you looking at at this time of year? And then work from this time of year to the spring and the summer. Sure thing. Um, I'll start with so requirements of a large pike are different from requirements of a smaller pike where large pike are more of a cold water species and smaller pike can tolerate warmer temperatures uh, throughout the year. So I start with, and I'm going to talk specifically about this trophy pike fishery and not just catching pike. You can catch pike in deep creek year round, but if you want to target large pike, then I never target large pike until the water temperatures, surface water temperatures drop below 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. So um, what will happen is whenever you get into kind of the Memorial Day to mid-June time frame, lake temperatures are going to jump above 70. Those bigger fish that need that colder water are going to kind of retreat out to the depths. 
and mm-hmm. they're going to find those areas um find those areas in deep creek generally the thermocline sets up in the 25 to 30 foot range and they're going to find those preferred habitats that they like where that thermocline intercepts those habitats and they're just going to kind of hang out for the summer and my experience has been that whenever you get those fish first coming back out of there in the fall their condition is a little bit on the light side they're not um it's a little bit of a stressful period for them because again we're like on the edge for these trophy pike uh we are on the southern edge and it it because we have a a a reservoir that stratifies and we have that cool water down near the thermocline that still has enough oxygen they're able to persist but they're not really growing a lot that time of year what at what depth do they like to suspend generally speaking i don't target them so i can't say for sure but you i use my sonar a lot and i see marks that i would bet money are large pike and they're suspending just above the thermocline Mm. it's it's going to be in that 25 foot range now i say that and i'm going to caution anybody that's listening if you want to go out and target these trophy pike don't target them in the summer for one the lake is very very busy uh there's a lot of recreational traffic on the lake in the summer so it's not as enjoyable of, of an experience being out there as an angler because you're getting rock and rolling all day long that coupled with the fact that surface temperatures that go into the mid upper 70s sometimes uh, going over 80 degrees when you catch a fish uh that is down near the thermocline you bring that fish and fight that fish up through that warmer water uh that's a very stressful thing for that fish and um you're going to increase the odds that that fish won't survive post release if you're going to choose to release them so Um, if you have intention to harvest those fish, fish, I guess that's a time, but at the same time, because of their, because of the fact that they're a little bit stressed thermally, it's not a time of year that they're really feeding that heavily. Mm -hmm. So it's not putting the odds in your favor to catch those big fish to go in the middle of summer. So generally speaking, I tell anybody that wants to go out and try to catch a big pike in deep Creek, avoid, avoid mid June to, you know, about now so really between now and then ice in and then ice out until uh, i guess they're spawning or or really when they go up shallow then yeah from now all the way through until you know late may early mid june next year uh is is the pike time my personal preference is right now um the water temperatures just two or three days ago dipped below 70. Uh, we've had we had a, a pretty first major cold front of the fall uh, that really dropped the surface temperatures pretty quickly and went out. Uh, I was on the lake yesterday with my son and kind of saved the day. The, the walleyes were being a little stingy for us. So um, we targeted some pike with some lighter tackle than I usually do. And we're able to go shallow and, and pick up, you know, a, a decent number of fish uh, pretty quickly. So the transition is happening. And right now through uh, through the time when when a lot of folks want to be sitting in a tree stand bow hunting uh, is is my favorite time to be out there, uh, which certainly poses a dilemma for me because I'm I'm a big bow hunter as well. <laughs> so um, it's uh, it, it's pick and choose uh, bow hunt the, the better condition days for them and and then take the boat whenever conditions are, are more favorable that way. But, uh, yeah, so fall, uh, getting into, as the temperatures start to drop, those big fish are going to migrate up and out Mm -hmm. and, uh, typical, typical fall spots for most fish species, but understand that pike are ambush predators, right? Um, what do you mean by up and out? I mean, up and out of the deep water. Okay. Yeah. Getting into that. I mean, anywhere from six to six to 14, 15, up to 17 feet ish um they're ambush predators uh, they hide and wait and then attack whenever they're going to feed so keeping that in mind it's going to help you to narrow down where to approach pike on the lake and understanding that there is an abundance of quality habitat um, whether it's main lake points mm-hmm. or back bays uh, there it it takes time and and that's i would say the next the next thing is, okay, when the when is you get the water temperatures into the mid sixties, 
all the way through fall turnover. Whenever we drop into the low 60s, upper 50s, the lake turns over, mixes throughout. You have pretty even temperatures top to bottom. Those big fish move back up shallow. They're starting to feed pretty heavily at that time because those big females, which maybe remind me, we'll come back to touch on some of the information we've learned about growth. But these big fish that you're targeting are all females. Um, and by big, I'm talking three footers to 40 plus inches. Um, these are all going to be females in the lake. So um, those females are trying to produce a lot of eggs. So you have you have dropping water temperatures for, I mean, this is the case for a lot of mm -hmm. freshwater fish species. You get those dropping water temperatures in the fall. They start to put the feed bag on, so to speak, where they're trying to build up their condition going into the winter. And especially for spring spawning species, they're going to start to be developing eggs uh, through the winter as well. And pike are early spring spawners. They're oftentimes pushing the ice off the lake, so to speak, to try to get up into those shallow bays and those the the warmest water there and be able to start to spawn and um so because of that this time of year is prime these fish are really really starting to feed a lot and it really puts the odds in your favor and um yeah so now that said i guess going into the how um and let's back up a little bit, like like um, um let's go with a, a big picture look um for the people that that may or may not know actually about Deep Creek. Um, I have a map pulled up. It's a very unique fishery when you look at the geography and how it sets up. It's almost like two lakes with a choke point in between that connects them. Yes. Um, with this lake, what is the primary forage for predator fish, whether it's walleye, smallmouth, um, or, or pike? Forage base, uh, and that's something that I really wanted to better understand this year while doing our seining surveys. Um. There's a, there are fairly abundant golden shiners in the lake, okay. but from what I can gather, and we haven't done dietary studies yet, and it's something that may be warranted in the future, but uh, yellow perch and bluegills, and yellow perch specifically, are a significant part of the forage base for all the game fish in Deep Creek. And there's a reason why an SR5 shad wrap in yellow perch color yeah. will catch literally everything. I just, I caught a, accidentally caught a pike about a week and a half ago that was a, I don't know, a, 30, a 36 inch fish or so. So there's not a lot of pelagic species of forage that they're going to be targeting there. What's interesting is um, there are almost pelagic type bluegills where you'll see bait balls of, hmm. and, and I found this out by running down riggers near the dam for trout that suspended 15 to 20 feet down you would see bait balls. And I was at the time running down riggers trying to catch trout that will hold over through the summer down at the thermocline. And down near the dam is one of the most popular places for that to happen. And whenever I would bring those fish up, they were coughing up numbers of, you know, quarter to half inch long bluegills. Is there a lot of aquatic vegetation that they're suspending off of, or is it just structural details? Nah, it's just they're in that case, it is, they're truly pelagic. Huh. and they're just that's crazy kind of cruising around out in that open water so that's yeah. weird i yeah. mean like i just you never think of like bluegill doing that kind of behavior i it, now that said there are plenty of fry bluegill in the very shallow water in the vegetation and around that cover but it, it was a little eye-opening for me as well that you do have those those bait balls of bluegills that just kind of hang out down there they're not super abundant mm -hmm. but they're certainly there and then how big is Deep Creek Lake for people that don't know? 3,900 acres. Okay, it's so full pool. It's roughly, it's it's decently small for having outboard capability. Yeah. Um, so I can see where like between like, you know, Memorial Day, Labor Day, like that can be um, pretty sporty to be out there. That the kind of the, the standard for anglers, if you talk to folks, they're going to say up till Memorial Day and after Labor Day is the time to be on the lake if you want to go fishing mm -hmm. because uh, the boat traffic during the summer months, the recreational boat traffic is pretty substantial. Now, that said, there's also a pretty decent bite that occurs because of all that wave action. Mud lines form through the middle of the day mm, okay. and fishing those mud lines, uh, particularly for for walleye, surprisingly, you know, midsummer bluebird days, 
Uh, if you know where to look for them, you can find walleyes pretty consistently uh, during that time. If you can, if you can stand the rocking and rolling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's something with like Lake Anna too, which, which is a, a real issue is you just don't fish it between that, that timeline. Yeah. That you don't fish it between that timeline um, because of all the, all, all the traffic. And, and John mentioned this earlier too, when, when we did, uh, when he was in here, like, cause that lake gets really pounded with, with just the, the, uh, I want to say commercial, but the vacationers really, mm -hmm. really that time of year yeah. and how it changes, how the, how the fish position and everything, what, um, and with that said, and if you look at like a Google earth map guys, things like that, you can see there's a lot of docks. Like what, what is the available cover and the structural elements of deep Creek? Like, and you mentioned like, there's not a lot of aquatic vegetation in deep Creek. Correct? No, there's a lot of, oh, oh there is. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, and deep Creek is, I mean, from a habitat standpoint, it, it has a little bit of everything. It's, it's really there's really an abundance of habitat there um, from large rock boulder type habitat to uh, pea gravel, you know, more. It's a lot like Lake Champlain, almost like the Northern fisheries type of deal. Then. Okay. The very, very abundant oh. SAV and a very diverse SAV community. Really? That, um, and, and this is where I'm going to start to, I'm going to start to defer to our SAV people a little bit uh, that, that, I actually intend to be on the boat with very, very soon to kind of get a better handle on all that. But, um, yeah, it's, it's got a very healthy SA, SAV, uh, community mm -hmm. and it's one that, um, it's very, very ubiquitous throughout the lake and, you know, different species grow at different depths and things of that nature. Uh, but, uh, you know, so you have that good mix of rock habitat, you have the SAV habitat. There is, a decent amount of wood habitat. If you know where to look for it, there are stumps there. Are, there's, there are very few standing trees. There are just a few that I have waypoints for, mm -hmm. um, just from finding them on sonar, but by and large, the trees were, were cut down, but there is a lot of stump habitat as well. So, uh, from a fish habitat standpoint, there's, it's, it's pretty darn good. Um, yeah. Like what is the difference between fishing big streams versus little streams besides like the area that you have to cover? Is it more of the pressure? Yeah. Um, the area that you have to cover is, is, is a big one. Um, you, those small stream fish are, I mean, they, they're fishing in the barrels, so to speak. They, they don't have a lot of places to go and they're, they're going to tuck into the, the places with the best habitat. They're going to, they're going to kind of hole up there, so to mm -hmm. speak. And, you know, when you're trying to target and find those big fish that are fairly uncommon throughout that system, um, your approach to them has to be different because every everything from vibration on walking up the bank to make your approach. If, if, if there's an undercut bank, you know, any, any subtle impact can put that fish down and you're done where in a larger river, it just, you can get away with a little bit more. I would also just think too, they get more, it doesn't take as much to make them really pressured too. Yeah. And that's got to make you a better angler. And I always thought about one thing I'm fascinated about is Japanese anglers. Um, and when you find videos of them translate it, and they have like three lakes in their country. Mm -hmm, and yeah. that's why all like the big innovations when it comes to techniques and stuff comes from them because those fish just get beat to snot. But it makes you a hell of an angler. And they come over here and they think it's just a utopia with so much water. And I, I, I got to feel like that's what you feel like too when you grow up doing that and you get to go to other places. And it's like, this is easy. Yeah. Well, it's or I easier. Never, <laughs> yeah, it's easier. <laughs> Let's put it that way. I never feel like it's easy. Uh, on rare occasion, you'll have those days where the stars align and it feels easy. But um, yeah, certainly um, the progression along the way and the way that I approach trout fishing and being really a small stream guy, especially fishing spring creeks that are generally gin clear and, and difficult. Um, and, you know, fishing wild fish a lot that are that are generally a little more cagey and difficult to catch it honed that skill set a little bit uh so when you get on on different waters it again it's not easy but it's it yeah it's prepared me well uh to be successful what's harder harder to target than a, a, a trophy size pike or walleye or a trophy size let's say brook or brown depends where you are i think is that's, that's a cop out. So all things that, equal. Yeah, all things, that is, all, all things equal. Answer. All things equal. <laughs> all since, since you've caught like probably the, the citation. We'll get in this, guys. I'll put a picture up. A citation sized pike, probably one of the biggest in the lake. And then you've also dealt with trout your whole life. Like what, what's harder to fool? 
Um, I'm going to go with the trout. Okay. And maybe that's just a personal bias. I, I don't know. I, I feel like with Big Pike and – we're, I believe we're going to talk about presentations and things here shortly mm -hmm. with big pike. Um, they're, they're kind of like a hyperactive dog. That's a when, hell of an analogy. Like. When, when, when they, when they, <laughs> when they want to eat, I don't believe there's really anything you can do to keep them from eating. You can reel as fast as you can when they want it, they're going to get it. And it's, it's not, the challenge isn't tripping their trigger necessarily. It's more finding them. You know, when you're, when you're targeting the top 1% or top 10% of a given fishery, mm -hmm. no matter what it is, and you're, you're focusing on those big, big, big fish, then they, they aren't behind every rock and they aren't, I, I could go to deep Creek pretty consistently and expect to just bounce around to, you know, make the milk run, so to speak, and hit those prime spots. And I expect to catch pike. I'm going to catch pike. But you can't expect a 38, 40, 40 plus incher all the time. But between that and trout, it's a little it's a little easier, I think, to, to fool that trophy pike than it is the, the trophy trout. And now, besides the obvious differences, what what are the differences between, like, I guess the personality of, like, a muskie and a pike? Because I think those are the two that are most comparable. I mean, generally speaking, you know, the legends, it's the fish of the 10,000 casts. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to catch one. one are, are they like that? Are they a lot tar tougher when it comes to personality to get to commit to a bait than a pike? They're very different in their personalities. And I'm, I've fished muskies uh, a fair amount thanks to some friends that, that fish that Potomac fishery, um, a fair amount. They've, they've given me access, uh, that way. Muskies are fish at 10,000 casts seem, seem a little stingier, like less likely to, to fully commit to a bait, but muskies on the other hand are going to eat a figure eight potentially where pike is, I've only ever in, all the pike I've caught, I've only caught maybe one or two in a figure eight. Really? Yeah. That's uh, interesting, actually. I, I do it all the time. But there's something about the, just the attitudes of the two. Uh, but at, at the basic level, they're both esausids. They're both ambush predators. They have the same way of going about things. So the tips and tricks and how you how you go after them is 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 closer. It's, it's, it's almost like a large mouth and a small mouth. They're, yeah. they're both act like bass. But there's, diff there's small, subtle differences in how you present and, and target. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that that's a good way to put it, I believe. Um, they're gonna they're gonna occupy similar habitats. You're gonna present, and again, I'm talking about targeting the the trophy. Yeah, the big the big dogs. Yeah. Um, that you know you're gonna use similar setup, similar lures, similar presentations to catch either one, and you're probably uh, it's gonna be one or the other. Typically, it's very rare that you have a uh, trophy pike and trophy musky fishery. Hmm. That are in this, you know, in the same body of water, especially smaller bodies of water, uh, and that has to do with competition and the time of year that those fish spawn. And uh, typically, um, typically your northern pike are going to spawn a little bit earlier than your muskies, and those fry will hatch sooner. And oftentimes, what can happen is the time that the little pike are transitioning to other fish as food is about the time that little muskies are the right size to be eaten hmm. by those little pike. So there's competition that way. So um, some of your bigger Canadian fisheries, you know, really, I mean, tens of thousands of acres. Lake of the Woods, places yeah. like that. Yeah. yeah, you can find trophy pike, trophy muskies, but it's um, it's not a common thing in this neck of the woods. So. How do you, and, and this will guys, and don't worry, we'll get to like, you know, how you target them, uh, techniques and everything. But, um, we mentioned it and, and, you know, I'm going to throw it up on the screen here that you caught an absolute just donkey of a pike. And, and then you went through with your studying and, and your surveys and you're like, oh crap, this was actually probably one of the biggest fish in the lake yeah. that I actually caught. Like, like yeah. touch on that a little bit more about what, what sizes are you actually specifically 
you're you're at the upper end of what's available for the pike given the range that we're in for the pike species correct yeah yeah that's it um it's not common again to find find 40 inch fish this far south it, rarely you can but um to be able to go to a, a place and expect to catch them is, is maybe a different story now what really piqued my interest in pike you know, before I was regional manager and Deep Creek Lake was one of the fisheries I was responsible for, I, I had a love for toothy critters. I've always been a walleye, musky kind of guy. And um, I started fishing that musky fishery, but you're always hearing those reports from anglers that this 40-inch fish is being caught out of Deep Creek, this 36-inch fish is being caught. You know, really big pike. So just hatch the idea that, Hey, I've got all this big tackle musky gear. Let's go out and, and see if we can't target big pike and mm -hmm. try and catch a 40 inch pike. Cause dang it. I like muskies. Why not big pike too? Yeah. You know, it, it was an easy transition, I guess. And, and a logical one. So the first day, the first day out, um, as, as luck would have it, I was fishing with my previous, uh, supervisor Al Heft, and um, I was throwing uh, throwing a bulldog, uh, big soft plastic bait, and um, I hooked and lost a really good fish, kind of early in the day. Uh, probably looking back, I thought it, at the time I was like, "Oh my god, that was a forty incher," mm -hmm. but eh, it was really probably a thirty five or thirty six. But I was like, "Okay, this can be done." And a little bit later in the morning, uh, the the picture that you mentioned sharing. Um, I actually caught my personal best the first day I ever targeted trophy pike in Deep Creek. Um, so I uh, set the set the bar you set the bar real high high to start, <laughs> and that that was a forty three inch fish, and it really kind of sparked my love affair with that fishery, and really sparked my interest in it. So I was given the permission from the regional manager at the time to go ahead and get some tags do a basic floyd tagging study i'm out there all fall long chasing these trophy pikes so let's start to put some tags in them start to learn a little bit more about you know where they live do we have some seasonal movements you know how often are they being caught are they being harvested growth rates you know how long were they when they were tagged versus how long are they when they are recaptured uh by an angler and, and guys, I'm sharing on the screen right now so everyone can see it. So that's 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 to give you an idea of like the size. Like that's a 40 incher. And you said right right at 40 inches. That one's 43. 43. Yep. And that's still pretty like putting it in perspective. That's a big damn fish. That's, it's that's really nice to have on the end of your line. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, certainly. It, it's it. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, I mean, that's a trophy. Like there's, there's a like, reason why I chase those fish. Yeah. Like, I mean, and then like dude like that's that's a decent one anywhere like i know like people probably think when you guys are on and you watch some of the tv shows like a 60 inch and all that stuff but that's no slouch that that 40 inch fish that's not bad at all no 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 and, and really south of alaska and there's some big pike waters in you know northern minnesota and in canada mm -hmm. uh, that produce some really spectacular fish in the upper 40 inch range pushing 50 inches but in this part of the world, and this is something that we learned from that tagging study and collecting scales and determining age at length, uh, plotting that data on a, what's called a Von Bertalanthe growth curve. Uh, basically, you, we, have, we have what's called length at infinity. Mm -hmm. And it's assuming that a fish could live forever. How long could they potentially get? And based upon the curve of that uh, growth data, we can estimate what the biggest fish possibly could be, um, in, in, within a fishery. And what was interesting is looking back at the historical data that we have when pike were collected and my personal catch and the catch of other people that I know, uh, that's, that's getting close to it right there. That wow. fish, um, length and infinity in deep Creek for Northern pike is right around 44 inches. And, um, of all the fish that I know were, were bumped on a board, uh, or measured accurately um they just don't get a lot bigger could it produce a 45 or a 46 potentially yeah 
um, as with anything, this is, these are modeled numbers. Mm -hmm. Uh, there may be a fish that has the right combination of genetics, the right combination of, of environmental conditions throughout their life. And they happen to live at the right place, be at the right time that they may reach 45, 46 inches. But realistically, if you catch a, if you catch a fish in the 42 to 43 inch range, you're talking top 1% of the pike in the lake i mean that's that's a that's a pretty good one guys if you want to go out and try to target these things you don't have to go to canada you don't have to go to lake champlain uh up north you know you can go to, to deep creek and actually have success with this um and, and then speaking about having success is it is it fair to say that if you target musky that translates well um but if you don't have any equipment like if you just want to kind of get into this and not go down the rabbit hole completely quite yet just mm -hmm. just flavor it what do you need to have a uh, success or a chance of getting one to the boat yeah start off with beef up your gear uh to so, literally i've had takes in the fall which is part of the reason why you, you say about yeah it's a big fish but the way that they will take a bait uh, it's pretty impressive at times. I mean, I've I've literally had the rod just about ripped out of my hand. That's freaking cool. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> when a when a when a fish that's three feet long tries to tear the rod out of your hands, I mean, what's not fun? But um, it starts with some heavier tackle, and all you're going to do if you go too, too light is really frustrate yourself, and you're going to lose a lot of baits uh, because they will beat you up. They will beat your tackle up. So, so like all heavy rods, eight feet, like what's your setup? I mean, what, what are you using? I'm, uh, I'm throwing, uh, I have three or four setups that generally speaking, they're on the light end for muskies, maybe, um, medium heavy or I'm, I'm sorry, heavy to extra heavy okay. rods. Um, no lighter than heavy. You can catch them on medium heavy. Heavy sport. You can catch them on light <laughs> tackle. I've, I've done it it's it, it's a lot more sporting but the big thing is if you're going to target these bigger fish big fish big baits i mean there's definitely a correlation there don't get me wrong i know you'll probably get comments on that mm -hmm. but i've caught how many on a four inch swim bait and certainly oftentimes the biggest muskies each year get caught by guys fishing for walleyes so they will eat small baits but if you want to just target those big fish and kind of stack those odds a little bit you're throwing big baits and just from a personal endurance standpoint the bigger tackle is going to allow you to to grind it out longer and that's that's the other thing that probably should touch on is the fact that if you're gonna if you're gonna target those big fish you're gonna grind you're not expecting to go out and catch 10 or 15 of those a day uh you I expect to tangle with a nice fish every time I go out, not necessarily land it, but at least get bit. I've had days where I've caught multiple nice fish. I have yet to have a multiple 40 inch fish day. Um, I've, I've come close, but um, so again, when, when you're, it's a grind. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to grind it all day long, chucking big baits, you got to have tackle that's going to what, what brand rod are you, you what, what brand rod are you using is it is it custom or is it a, a general brand that people can purchase my favorite rod right now is i have a fenwick predator series and it's an eight and a half footer uh, i have a friend that has a um oh i'm trying to remember the brand it's a it's a big musky brand it's like i think chaos tackle makes it it's one of their telescoping like nine oh, footers, okay, extra gotcha. extra heavy and that thing, that thing is a joy to fish with. Um, but getting into the presentations maybe a little bit is the reason I haven't gone like super heavy. Um, I'm not throwing a lot of, you know, six, eight, 10 ounce baits necessarily pounder bulldogs and things of that nature. I'm throwing like light. I, I, I would characterize my whole setup as light musky tackle. 
way heavy bass tackle, light musky tackle. So we're talking, um, you know, for, for the people at home, um, if, if bass fishing on a core like this, you're going to go with your heavy flipping stick um, or a light musky rod. You're going to pair that with, I'm assuming you're going to go braid, right? Oh, uh, braid, certainly. Braid yeah. to a tag leader. Then are you going to go wire? Are you going to go braid straight to a wire leader? Generally I go, speaking? I'll fish wire and I'll fish fluoro, heavy fluoro. Okay, fluoro, um, okay. Depending on the presentation. If I'm, if I'm fishing a plastic bait, I generally like to fish a fluoro leader. Uh, 130 pound fluoro um but i'll run you can get away with 50 pound braid 80 pound braid is kind of standard on 80 my pound setup. Braid? okay yep and <laughs> that's not because it's necessary uh, i guess as much as these baits are expensive yeah and i, mean, and I don't want to lose of a lifetime too you yeah. don't want to you want to be able to just get it in the boat yeah and, and you know that that's it um baits are expensive i don't want to lose them mm -hmm. you're talking big fish fish are fish of a lifetime or at least fish worthy of a picture and a post to your social media. <laughs> um, you want to get the fish in the boat and you don't want to lose tackle or beat up tackle in the process. I mean, it'll get a beat up on its own. You fish that size are, are going to take a toll on your gear. But um, I, th that's where I would start is beef up your stuff. Um, if you're going to target these big fish and then beef up your tackle a little bit. Uh, plenty of big pike get caught on standard bass size spinner baits. Uh, spinner baits, uh, that's a day in day out for me. Uh, it's very versus very, an inline spinner. I like spinner baits because of the fact that I'm usually in and around weeds, gotcha. targeting pike, and I can swim them through. And I'll generally put a, a large stinger hook on if the most musky spinner baits already come with one. But if they don't, I'll add a large stinger hook and put some sort of a like a like a lunker city six inch swim bait um in a color that just goes well with whatever color spinner bait you have and that'll be that'll be my setup so the the total spinner bait itself uh i like spinner baits that with the trailer they'll be six seven inches long wow that is and, a hell of a thing to be chucking all day no yeah. wonder you have to like get your tackle right because you're going to get worn the heck out <laughs> yeah especially i like tan i prefer tandem blades single blades work yeah i like tandem blades they they move more water and a little more attractive and generally they're a six and an eight or an eight and a ten blade on there gotcha. so they displace a lot of water mm -hmm. and that's another reason why i go with the heavier tackle it's it's it'll it'll withstand that a lot better in the shock of when they when they actually hit and, and then yeah. you know in front of you got a couple of baits um why, why don't you uh, hold a couple up to the camera just for people like just this is just generic stuff guys to get kind of get you started into it okay so yeah this one here actually that that fish that you saw me holding um in the picture was caught on this exact bait and really color. yeah um uh, the mini uh, i'm sorry not this exact bait it was a bulldog same color uh natural the right color, genre basically yeah. Yeah, yeah uh but the soft plastic baits like that are very productive and pike are a sucker for blades um this is an inline um i guess it's just a double cow junior double cowgirl um i believe this has size eight eight blades on it um maybe um but yeah big bladed tinsely bright flashy uh burning these things uh again uh, pike are very comfortable in water temperatures that generally will start to slow other like bass and, and fish like mm. that will start to slow down a little bit. Your presentations have to slow down to go with it. Um, you, you can, you can burn these things. Uh, and the reason I, like we just mentioned, the reason I generally fish spinner baits is they're a little more weedless. The other thing is um, the, the inline spinners, they'll, they'll tend to just absolutely inhale them. And you have a, a big trouble hook back there in and around the gills and such. And if you intend to release the fish, then, uh, spinner baits, in my experience, have been a little bit, a little bit easier on them. From well, a what's catch what's interesting like. with 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 pike, and then you know we have talked a little bit about musk on the show. You're not dangling a worm. You're not throwing a shaky head. You're not milking these areas as much. Everything is is a is a horizontal. You're moving and you're covering it water. It seems like is that a fair assessment? Yeah. Uh, very. Yes. Yes, that is a fair assessment. You're covering water, and that's generally what I'm doing. Is I have my milk run that I've i've learned over years of doing this and just start at the beginning and usually i'll randomly pick a spot so i don't feel like i'm always hitting the same spots at the same time but um 
kind of start at the beginning and just cover the water and I'll fish them one way and then fish them back the other way because of the way the fish will maybe sometimes set up on the structure. Um, in this case, in my case, oftentimes we're, we're fishing weeds. Um, okay. but the way the fish will set up on it, sometimes the presentation coming one way versus the other, but just covering, covering water, horizontal presentation. I'm throwing big crankbaits, things like, um, depth raiders, uh, baby depth raiders, uh, or even shallow raiders have hmm. their place as well. Then spinner baits are, a, are a standby inline spinners too. Uh, but again, I, I day in day out on generally more of a spinner bait guy. Um, are you chucking and winding? Or are you doing a lot of trolling? I'm chucking and winding. And the reason for that is, uh, for one, uh, you're fouling a lot of baits when you're trolling because of the way the weeds set up on deep creek. Yeah, gotcha. There's a deeper cabbage and there's also a pond weed species that will just kind of jut out of these traditional where 20 years ago, there may have been a nice long straight weed edge of milfoil, for instance, and you control that edge a little more effectively. Um, because of the way the species composition is changing and, and the vegetation is changing. Uh, I like to cover, cover those pockets a little bit better and I'm predominantly casting. Plus it's a lot more fun to get bit when you're casting. Yeah. It's not as to good. me. Yeah, like, yeah. I mean, I got ADHD too. So that's why I can't catfish very much. Uh, I just cannot just sit in one spot and just, yeah. you're just sitting and driving the boat around. Um, but, and that something else that's interesting too, when you, when you say you're, you're covering water, if you're on a spot, because this seems like, like you, you said, like it's a dog with ADHD, like how long do you give a spot generically before you move? Just general. I'm going, th I'm going through it once. Oh, really? Just once. Wow. Yeah, I'm okay. going through it once. And like I say, I, when I say go through a spot once, I'll go one direction. And usually it, now that I, I've upgraded to iPilot, I'll go through it once. His trolling motors are so good. And I mean, I'll set my track, turn around and retrace it. And again, I'm trying to get fish that may be set up differently on the structure. And once I do that, I move to the next one, into the next one, to the next one, to the next one. You're either going to trip the trigger or you're not. Mm. And you can sit there and burn it and burn it and burn it. Yeah, maybe you could soak a bait. That doesn't, this is personal preference now. We're getting, could you sit there on a spot and soak a bait for a few hours and potentially catch a fish that I'm not going to? Absolutely. But my preference and the fact that I don't like to sit still, I like to cover water. I like to see different scenery. Mm -hmm. uh, I like to fish active fish because active fish want to eat. I don't like to fish neutral or negative fish because they're more difficult. Conditions call for it. I will if I have to. But given my preference, I'm going to bounce around, try to find those active fish, hit them, and, and move on. Now, are there days that I may move a fish that was neutral? And you'll get follows similar to a muskie sometimes. Uh, again, they'll 99% of the time, in my experience, they're going to shy at the boat. Uh, they're going to see the boat and they're going to turn away that quick. It's so crazy for yep. a fish that big that they're, yeah, it they're is. boat shy. Yeah. And, and the fact that muskies are known for yeah. figure eight strikes and uh, pike generally aren't. Um, but if I see a fish, I'll let them cool down a little bit, cool down, so to speak. I'll go fish and come back a couple hours later, hit them again, hmm. with a different presentation, try to trip the trigger. But um, no, I'm, I'm generally... Um, I'm not looking at the same place twice. Interesting. That's really interesting. Yep. So with the size of like, that's like under 5,000 acres and, and you're dealing with this predator, like how much pressure are they getting right now? Is there a lot of anglers right now specifically targeting pike or is it, is it, is it a small cult community that's doing it? it my impression now, I don't have fishery, yeah, yeah. uh, creel survey data to be able to say, certainly, are you targeting pike or, or whatever? But I, um, from what I can gather and the people that I've talked to and, and understand there's, it's more of a smaller cult following and a lot of the bigger pike that get caught each year, just like muskies are caught accidentally by mm -hmm. people that are targeting other fish species. And that's just kind of the way it is. Um, again, to my understanding now, um, certainly as word gets out that this trophy fishery does exist mm -hmm. there. Um, it, I would almost expect to see a little more of it. And I, I'm hearing more about ice anglers that are targeting them through the ice and taking specialized tip up setups to, to catch them that way. Um, but it's still, it's still one of those fisheries that it takes a serious commitment to say, I'm going to go out and catch, I'm going to fish for trophy fish. 
And it, I think that's pretty common no matter the fish species. Yeah. But when you're talking about muskies or pike, you're talking about even further specialized gear where I can say I'm going to go target trophy walleyes, but I can still use the same walleye gear that I'm already using. Where if you have to beef up all your tackle and beef up all your equipment and looking at the price tags on a couple of these things, um, it's an investment, not only monetarily, but also with time to, to really dive into it, mm -hmm. so to speak. Um, so, you know, that's something that you, you really got to want to do it. And yeah, so that, that may be one of those controlling factors that is going to limit a lot of folks from really going after the big fish is just the fact that it, it does it, it's a big commitment and it's, it's an interesting dilemma too when you have a lake like that like how much pressure can it handle because like you know you you guys um you want to you take so much care in developing a, a world-class fishery but then it's like double-edged sword that means you're also going to get more you know traffic there and yeah. and like how much and this is just because like i know like lake anna is where everyone from dc goes to play and i know a lot of people go to deep creek to play so like how much can that fishery actually take um before you see like the effects of that and, and not just like not on the necessarily the population but their behavior and how that changes yeah. um i know in certain places with, with bass like you can definitely know that they change their behavior when they have all that pressure on top of them yeah well yeah and, and to that point i guess I'll, I'll start with saying i don't know where the mm -hmm. tipping point is um heck we may have already passed the tipping point we don't know it yet um but we we do keep tabs on that pike fishery and we had done some intensive monitoring there over about a five or six year period um and there it's slated to be sampled deep creek slated to be sampled again for the pike specific spring survey in the coming spring during 2023, 2023 okay. so uh that kind of gives us a, a finger on the pulse of how the fishery's doing there um we also have some fishery creel surveys planned for the lake so we'll start to get some of that uh, angler use um angler effort and the amount of effort that's that's on you know not only the pike fishery but all the fisheries in the lake so uh the short answer is I don't know. And it, it's, I feel like that's a difficult thing to characterize too, when you're talking about the upper echelon yeah. of the fishery, you know, when do you start to see a change in that? Um, the first step though, is to understand how the fishery behaves and we're in the process of doing that and collecting the data we need. So we know how, how you know, how does their recruitment happen? And for instance, we, we had some significant increases in catch rate during the the last couple of years of our pike survey and that would have been in the 2018 19 time frame and now we are getting a lot of reports from anglers that they're catching a lot of pike in the 24 to wow. 30 plus inch range and i think it's the fact that um I, I believe that there was probably a good year class or two that came off there. Now, the next step is understanding, is that a cyclical thing or have changes in the SAV community and things of that nature in the lake allowed for better recruitment success? Is this a change that we can expect to see consistently moving forward? Monitoring data is going to tell us that. It would be interesting when you, get on the boat, when you get on the boat with the SAV crew to be able to like, because uh, I'm always fascinated by that and how the different vegetation, like how that affects a fishery, both positively and negatively. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah that's going to be really interesting. Um, there are a couple of other lakes that I don't think people know about. I, until you told me like over a text message, I didn't even know they existed. Honestly, um, the, the electric motor only lakes that, that you have, you, you get to deal with in, in your area. Um, yeah. Can we highlight those real quick? Yeah. Yeah. Sure thing. Yeah. We have a couple of them and uh, we sampled uh, two of, Two of the three that I'm going to mention, uh, we sampled just this year. And um, so the, the, I, I'll just start with where they are. The, the first one is the smallest of the three, and that's uh, Broadford Lake. And it's a small impoundment down in southern Garrett County, a little bit south of Bee Creek. And that's um, it's a really nice little bass fishery. It has a great panfish community. We also stock some striped bass in there. Really? Uh, to help control the panfish. And historically, we've stocked 
some tiger muskies as well. Um, again, that's to kind of prevent biologically prevent the overpopulation of panfish so that we can maintain decent growth rates and have more desirable size distribution for the, for those fisheries. But, um, it also has, uh, Broadford has a really nice, uh, largemouth fishery in it. Now, earlier on, we talked about, you know, the different metrics that we look at and, um, size distribution is one and proportional size distribution is, is a metric that we calculate that, um, it's basically the, the percentage of your adult fish that are quality size and larger. And Broadford is a lake that has a really, really high, hmm. it's called PSD, proportional size distribution. Um, it has a really high PSD. So it's dominated by nice adult size fish, but not many of those intermediate and smaller size fish. So um, kind of what we, we, we thought maybe happening there is you have abundant crappy, abundant yellow perch and abundant uh, bluegill and pumpkin seed. So you have a number of panfish that can certainly impact your recruitment success for the, the basses. And uh, we've actually taken management action in Broadford uh, this past, uh, this past spring. Um, we were killing two birds with one cent stone, so to speak, where we have a, another lake, uh, Greenbrier Lake, that I'm sure you're more familiar with, mm. that has a super low PSD. So it's dominated by small bass, uh, generally sort of stunted size bass. So by removing fish from there and moving them to Broadford, we can increase the abundance and hopefully help to tip the scale yeah. and improve recruitment in Broadford while reducing densities in Greenbrier and hopefully release those fish to maybe grow a little bit faster and get a little bit better size structure there. So uh, those are some current and ongoing management actions that that is occurring in Broadford Lake. And uh, we're going to continue to monitor that and hopefully see some some positive changes in, in terms of that bass fishery there. Does, does Broadford have a lot of, is, is it more of a, a boat access, kayak access type of lake? Is there a lot of bank fishing opportunities at Broadford? Yeah, there's a fair amount of bank fishing and um, you can, you can really access the lake both ways. Uh, there, there's a really nice little concrete boat ramp there that um, you, you can soft launch kayaks and canoes. You can bank fish. A lot of people bank fish for the pan fish, especially. And then you can also throw your boat on and, and cruise around and it's electric and it's pretty small. You, you don't have to worry mm -hmm. too much. I mean, even if you kill your battery, you can, you can probably find your, find your way to shore yeah, somewhere yeah. and not have too long of a walk. But, so. but again, it's like, it's just like those little opportunities that people probably would overlook. Cause if I think of one, like everybody knows about just the name would be deep Creek, but like Broadford, like, like how many, like that, it, but then it's a great place probably to take a kid that they're, you're going to be able to pound yeah. some bluegill and be able to catch something. Whereas yeah. there are certain lakes, I mean, I'm going to think like Clear Lake in Virginia guys is an example where it's like, it's hard to buy a bite there. And just so knowing the different opportunities that are available and in the hidden gems that, mm -hmm. that you can have success with. Um, and then I think you said like Lake, I'm going to butcher this name, Habibi. Like, is, is it Lake Habib? Lake, Lake Habib. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Rocky Gap. Rocky uh, Gap. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. We can stick with Rocky Gap. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, Lake Habib is uh, completely within Rocky Gap State Park okay. and it's publicly accessible along the entire shoreline. Uh, again, a very nice uh, launch boat launch there that um, that is an electric only lake, and it's one that um, it has a it has a very nice bass fishery, uh, very good size structure, uh, a good abundance of fish, where you you can go and expect expect to have an opportunity to catch not only some nice largemouth but but some numbers of largemouth. In addition to that, it's got a really nice panfish community, uh, yellow perch, bluegills. It also has red ear sunfish, and red ears can get fairly large, um, up to 11, 12 inches. Yeah, that's and, a very like interesting like topography too. That thing I didn't realize that. Um, yep. How big is that then? Like that's hard to visualize. Is that under two hundred acres? Yeah, I knew you'd ask me that, yeah. <laughs> and I uh, I meant to I meant to double check it um it's under a thousand then right we, oh you know, it's, it's, it's way go. under a thousand okay yeah, yeah 200 is going to be pretty close okay um, gotcha so somewhere in that in in kind of that range um it might be a little bigger than that but it's it's certainly under a thousand um and it, it's 
it's surprisingly deep for all the bigger it is and it will stratify hmm. uh sufficient to support trout year round okay and being electric only is um i i knew some folks that would go there in the summertime and run hand crank downriggers and catch trout in the oh, summertime wow. doing it that way plus it's very popular uh in the springtime as well both from the boat and the bank uh for the trout fishing opportunity in it what's the biggest bass you that you've seen pulled out of there or anecdotally heard of I talked to a fellow discussing some habitat improvement projects that, um, and if the numbers sticking right, um, he specifically tries to target bigger fish at night, trolling large baits and, um, six, seven, eight pounders. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah. Like that's that size. Of okay. Fish. Like there's some trophy trout, trout eaters. It sounds like, yeah. yeah, like that. It's so crazy. Like that's the most expensive way to fatten up your passes with trout. Cause I mean, there's some yeah. likes in, um, actually in Winchester that they stock trout. And if you throw a Huddleston after the trout stocking, it's amazing. Like it's such a small pond, but there are some massive bass because they yeah. just eat trout. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's so crazy when you, when you, when you look at some of these lakes, whether it's in Maryland or, or wherever the DNR stocks, like that's one of the interesting side effects of put and take trout is it's not just the, the humans that actually take them and, and consume them. It's uh, other predators that actually get to benefit from that as well. Yeah. Yeah, certainly that, uh, that does happen. And going back to the pike and deep Creek, um, the trout are going to be at the thermocline, the pike are at the thermocline. I haven't done any dietary studies on those fish yet, but it stands to reason that you have those two fish occupying the same niche of habitat during the summer months that when those pike do eat deep, I would venture to guess that at least part of their diet is going to include those, those trout that, that hang out there. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. we've covered like the gauntlet today. I mean, is there anything else that we, we forgot to touch on or, or anything that you want to plug that, that you're doing in your region or the DNR is doing right now or com have coming up? Yeah, if, if I can get a if Go I can get it. a plug on something, um, again, and I'm a walleye guy, and oh yeah, yeah we, we, we touched that. yeah goodness. we touched on that. <laughs> um, that's kind of boy. Uh, Why are the walleyes though? Like it's so like you said you'd rather you said you're a walleye guy. Like you mean like you would rather target them versus pike, or if you had if you had to pick, if boy if I had to pick, I'd drive myself crazy. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, uh, thankfully, thankfully the better fishing for each of those, it, I can kind of stagger my approach and satisfy all the desires. Um, whew, that's a yeah. great question. Uh, right now, walleyes I'd say would probably be edging out the pike. Just, I mean, they, a, they eat good and guys, you know, I just, I just threw this there up on the screen just to give you an idea of what, what deep Creek uh, has in it. Like, damn, they eat good too. Well, <laughs> and snakehead. I'm glad you brought that picture up because that is exactly the plug that I want to make. Okay. And for a couple of reasons, uh, first of all, that's, that's a 28, 28 and a quarter inch fish Beautiful. and, uh, deep Creek can produce those fish mm. and we have them very, very, very sporadically in our data set. The thing about walleyes and deep Creek is deep Creek has always had the reputation that you can go there and catch walleyes. And you'll catch numbers of walleyes, but catching legal size walleyes is the challenge. Hmm. Uh, the legal minimum size is 15 inches in the lake. Okay. And the reports are that the majority day in, day out of the fish that you're going to catch are 14, 14 and a half, 14 and three quarter. You're catching barely sub legal fish. So that leads you to one of two conclusions um, or some combination of the two that you have slow growth occurring. And because you alluded to the fact that they are delicious, um, yeah, they're oftentimes harvested. So if you have slow growth and you have even moderate harvest, you can pretty quickly chop those fish off. They mm -hmm. get above legal minimum size if they're growing slow. So our first step was we went out in 2021 and this past year, this past spring in 2022, during opening weekend of walleye season for anybody that's listening that was happened to be there. I know you saw us, uh, we had a table set up and fish that were already being harvested or fish that were caught as part of the opening day tournaments. Um, we collected otoliths from males and females where we could determine sex of different size classes and the otolith. And I can share a picture if you want to, 
put it in here. Some cool pictures. Yeah, that'd be great. Under yeah. a scope. Uh, basically, the otolith. It's an it's it's an ear stone. It's referred to. It's a small bone in the skull of the walleye. That if you crack their their head open, you can pluck them out with a pair of tweezers, crack them in half, toast them with a lighter, put them under a microscope, and you can count rings just like a tree. And it's a very accurate way to age walleyes. Now you're not and, dying these because like John talked about when he was on here about you know dying that that inner ear lobe like that, so that way you knew the difference between uh, yeah. wild and these are not because Deep Creek is totally supported by natural reproduction. Oh, okay, cool. So there's no stalking of walleyes. Gotcha. In Deep Creek. Um, but no, so we did that, pulled the otoliths and determined growth rates. Um, and the growth rate isn't the issue. Um, it's moderate, you know, it, it's, it's right in the range where it, it's not slow growth. We'll put it that way. So we kind of, kind of ruled out the slow growth. So the other piece of that puzzle was, well, what's harvest. Yeah. So what we did this past spring is we went out during the closed season. And we electrofished and tagged. And if you take a look at the picture that's on the screen, there's a yellow floy tag. In oh, the, yeah, yeah soft you can see that there. Uh, we tagged um, 450 legal size and larger walleyes in the lake. And uh, the reason for that is we put those fish back out in the closed season. And now as anglers catch those and call the tag information into us, and as you call that into us, we can take that information and we can determine harvest rate of legal size walleyes in the lake. And um, just a couple of basic questions. Where did you catch it? If you want to share. Most important being, did you harvest it? Did you release it? And uh, right now, um, this is preliminary data. So we have a few more months until the season closes at the end of February to collect more data. But right now we've been consistently north of 70 percent harvest rate so mm. that it seems at this point that that is the the, the smoking, culprit the smoking gun <laughs> yeah if you um we have high harvest rates it's, it's expected and it's those numbers are very comparable to you know other mid-atlantic walleye fisheries that have been studied for harvest rate uh, it's very very high because they're delicious and people like to eat these things. So, so well, yeah, what's the difference? And let's say, I'm, I don't know, I don't know of a Minnesota lake off the top of my head that's the same comparable size, but if there is like they're both lakes are 70% harvest rate, then what's the difference then? Is it that there's a population difference? Like other lakes up north can handle it, is what you're saying? Or what, what makes it so unique that this is an issue here? Uh, it's not really unique. Uh, okay. And you'll start to notice that a lot of those other fisheries have different regulations mm. on them. And I'll, I'll kind of get to that as, yeah, we, yeah. as we keep going here and kind of the purpose for all this and, and maybe what the direction we see this, this all going. But um, yeah, so essentially put those fish out, immediately started getting tag returns. And it was, it was really nice to see actually. And uh, for those of you that are listening, if you catch a tag fish and you call it in, we have some $50 uh, prepaid visa cards we're going to draw at the end of the oh, survey really cool. and if your name gets drawn we'll send you one in, in the mail so um yeah so kind of what we're seeing is yes they are a high harvest rate now what do we do with that looking back to the size distribution again more supporting evidence there's a thing called a length frequency histogram so you have different bins of lengths usually one inch increments where we'll have a total count of fish in our surveys for each of those one inch increments. You get to the 16 and 17 inch increments and then it's like a cliff. You have super abundant fish in the smaller size classes and then just a blip here and there with those bigger fish above 16, 17 inches. Hmm. So um, what we can do now and once this project is complete and we have an actual number for exploitation rate of that fishery, we can model regulation scenarios using okay. the growth, using the harvest and the mortality. We can estimate natural mortality. We can, we have numbers for fishing related mortality to come up with a total annual mortality. And then we can start to plug in different scenarios. So for instance, if we increase minimum size to, I'm just pulling numbers out of my head, 17 inches. Yeah what does that translate to in terms of size structure? 
and or another possible scenario would be if we imposed a protected slot from say 17 to 20 or 21 inches what does that mean you know how many more fish will we see at 18 inches will we see at 22 inches will we see at 28 inches and we can model all those and where we're going with all this is once we have all that data in hand and we have those modeling regulate the modeling of the regulation scenario is complete we can take that back out to the public mm. and present it and say hey if we maintain status quo you know what you have mm -hmm. hey, the fishery is what it is you'll continue to catch a lot of walleyes but you're going to struggle to catch legal fish and well i shouldn't say struggle that's not the right way to phrase that it's the your opportunity to catch legal size fish will be a little more limited uh, if we make this change, then here's what you can expect. This change, here's what you can expect. What do you want? And if there's an if, if, there, if there's an obvious majority preference there, then it paves paves the path pretty easily for us. If it's a toss up, then it becomes a judgment call. How much does and guys, we're gonna oh, spoil. We're gonna have Matt back on here probably in the wintertime sometime because I really want to talk about the ice fishing and also the safety aspect of it but um how much does the ice fishing affect the walleye population too like is is that is there a lot of anglers that i fish that may or may not legally or illegally harvest walleye since it could be a year-round issue um there if if you mm -hmm. knew they were doing it illegal illegally they'd be getting caught yeah true. um so that's that's an impossible thing to really fully understand but just speaking to ice angling in general, harvest preferences tend to be a little different for ice anglers where it's a lot more harvest oriented. Uh, again, ge I'm generalizing. Yeah, yeah. Um, there are plenty of catch and release ice anglers too and, and some that you know adopt more of a selective harvest. But there's also plenty that are going to keep every fish that they legally can. And while the season is open, walleyes are are caught regularly and often harvested when they're legal size. So um, I guess to be determined. Mm -hmm. And that's, I'm very curious to see how many tag returns we get through the ice fishing season, because certainly we had a peak in tag returns earlier in the project. It's mellowed a bit through the summer months. And part of that may be the fact that actual walleye angling pressure is a little lower plus the fact that you know it's just a that time of year on the lake is a, a little bit more difficult time to maybe just target walleyes um i'm curious to see as we're moving back into fall and the the recreational traffic has subsided the angling the angling traffic has certainly picked up the the lower parking lot at the lake was full yesterday oh wow um so as that angling traffic picks up, I expect to see more of a catch. It's it's going to be able to allow me to draw some inferences about seasonal differences in catch rates and all. But uh, I would expect that we're going to see, especially through the ice, that for the legal size fish that are being caught, a, a similarly higher, potentially even higher harvest rate. Um, speculating, of course, don't have a crystal ball. Yeah. But um, but yeah, that's that's kind of what I would expect to see going into it. And then the closed season starts March 1st and goes through um, through the middle of April there. And yeah, that's a time that certainly ice fishing can extend through March. Um, but really, and I do not have a creel survey to support this, but I th the impression I've gotten as an ice angler on the lake and as someone who talks to anglers very, very often is that the panfish fishery in Deep Creek is probably the bigger draw mm -hmm. for the ice angling crowd. I mean, the average size yellow perch in Deep Creek is pretty impressive. Um, you know, 12 to 14 inch fish it's are really, yeah. not uncommon at all. That's a really good size. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's some pretty spectacular ice fishing for panfish and I mean, year round really, but, um, and then bluegills, uh, there's, the size structure for bluegills in there is, is very, very good as well. Um, you know, you can, it's again, it's not uncommon to catch nine to 10 plus inch bluegills. So why well, you mentioned, um, earlier 
that it's it's a natural it's natural production in deep creek versus the potomac where you guys do supplemental stocking of walleyes mm -hmm. um why is supplemental stocking not a a way or a solution to help with the size of the walleye in deep creek lake well um i guess the the, the probably the elephant in the room is the logistics of it okay. um our hatcheries can produce so many walleyes a year and there are certain fisheries that cannot sustain a natural population savage river reservoir is another electric only lake that is supplementally stocked every year the potomac river has a natural population but is also supplementally stocked it doesn't have uh and i'm getting out of my region a oh, little yeah, bit yeah. here uh so john may be cringing as i say this um but the it's a great walleye fishery but may maybe not it, it definitely doesn't have the recruitment that deep creek, gotcha. deep creek consistently has very good recruitment it's a very stable environment you don't see a lot of those fluctuations you do in a riverine system where you get the wrong flows at the wrong time you can kill a year class deep creek is generally very very stable mm -hmm. with lake level and conditions every year for the spawn so you see a very consistent spawn and the recruitment is generally very very good and so that's we have I hesitate to say a better use for those fish, but we have a limited number of fish yeah, yeah. that that we need for other fisheries more so than Deep Creek that produces plenty of well, that's good to make the distinction and to communicate to everyone. It's not like it okay, in a perfect world, yeah, it might help and would work, but you only have so many assets and you can only move them around so many places. And that's the distinction there is like this is where we think it's best use of our of our assets and time. Yep. And yep. that really also shows you like how much fishing pressure there has to be for the walleye there. Um, and again, like everyone knows, like walleye are such a prized fish. But then, yeah, you think this is a five under five hundred thousand or five thousand five hundred thousand? That'd be insane. Yeah. Um, uh, under five thousand acres, and then I don't know how many boat ramps there are to even like cat like be able to like pull people as they go in and out um, to see how many are actually targeting the walleye. But if that's the case, and I could see that that could be an issue if you're having too much too many being pulled out. Well, and and, and that's basically kind of the as we hone in on this uh that's that's what it's looking like is there's a lot of effort and a high harvest rate so as fish reach legal minimum they're often being harvested and to your point there is very limited access to deep creek in terms of boat launches so um that's a positive for you guys that's then, a very right? positive yeah yeah and, and we we are in the process of planning a creel survey for deep creek to be able to estimate angler effort and see what species are being targeted and um it's going to make it a lot easier to get that component of the fishery characterized because the majority of the anglers are coming in and out of the state park but public boat ramp mm -hmm. there are a few private boat ramps but easily the lion's share of the effort is there at that public ramp that is a single point okay so uh that that makes that component simpler now ice anglers uh, there there are more places you can get on not to mention the fact that you know if you have a private permission you can walk through a yard to access it. it's it's not as it's not as um i guess confined mm-hmm so you don't have that bottleneck of everyone has to go through one entrance yeah. exactly exactly and that's where we switch to um what's referred to as more of a roving design where we go out for the to characterize the ice angling component or another big component with all the tourist traffic in the summer is dock fishing a lot of the people that i know that vacation to deep creek lake bring their fishing equipment so whole yeah wow sit yeah. on their dock Damn. and a lot of those people at the same time uh they keep the fish that they catch for the week that they're there and have a fish fry mm -hmm. one night and that's so those two components of that fishery need to incorporate more of a roving design where we're out there actively trying to find them and interview them where the boat angling component of it is is going to be a lot simpler that is interesting because and guys we we mentioned this off camera or my hypothesis with the dmv which incorporates really the hubs of dc and baltimore and, and the ring that you have your diehard hunters your diehard fishermen they're generational they understand the culture and then you have the people that are trying to get into it you know they they, they moved here from california whatever we're gonna go vacation at this house and they're not part of like the culture and the community of the outdoors 
And then when you have a deep creek or like in a, a lake that's heavily trafficked with not just, you know, anglers, but also people that they just dabble in it. Like how much of the, the impact is not actually the anglers that make it to blame, but it's somebody that just is going for a weekend that, that doesn't actually, this is their outdoor experience is one week in July. And how much of that is actually the culprit for, for the declining rate. Yeah. And, and that's it. Um, just as a, for instance, situation, if you have 10 anglers, that are very good at what they do, avids, if you will, and they catch their limit of walleyes every time they go, which would be, we'll say, 10 anglers, five mm -hmm. fish per, that's 50 fish total. If you put 200 dock anglers on the lake and e each one of them catches, on average, a half a walleye, yeah, they're taking twice as many fish out. And again, that's just a, for instance, to demonstrate your point, I guess that yeah, like sometimes we, we blame the angler and it's like, it's a very, it's a cop out thing. It's like, well, clearly like, you know, Jim who fishes for him all the time, he's the reason the walleye population is down versus like, okay, he, is it just him? And Sikorsky talked about this with striper fishing. It's like, it's not always just the angler. It's also like, it was the commercial people too, that you, you can't always gauge everyone that goes out there. Um, and then we try to blame one small group and it's not you guys individual, but the doc talk of like, well, this is the reason is because of this. And it's like, no, it, it, it's, it's such a small piece of this portrait that you have to look at and say, there's so many factors and it's never one thing. It that's really it. Is. That's it. Uh, most things have a, a multitude of variables that go into it. Uh, it's, it's rarely just a single smoking gun. Um, sometimes it is, mm. but, um, and, and that's why we intend to incorporate the, ice angling component, the dock fishing component into this creel survey, because you can't accurately estimate effort, estimate catch, estimate harvest without doing so. And those components can be a significant part of your overall yeah. take yeah. out of the lake. So that's, um, yeah, certainly something that we intend to characterize and, and something that's important to understand if you're going to understand the that fishery dependent. You've been work cut out for you. You really do. My yeah. God. I mean, that's just, that's a lot to deal with. <laughs> it's a lot. And creel surveys are a lot of work. Um, it's fun work because as we talked about before, I enjoy talking with anglers. Mm. Um, I, it's, it's a part of my job that, that, you know, that's, that's a way for me to keep my thumb on the pulse of what's happening out there. I, I really enjoy that feedback, but, um, Yeah. It's, um, it's fun work, but it's a lot of work to, to conduct a creel survey because it's ours out there. And if you're, whether you're roving or just sitting at the dock a fishery survey station beside you and trying to catch everybody that comes off, um, it, it, it takes an army. Uh, you know, we have limited staff within my region. I got two, I've got two awesome biologists that work for me, but we're still just three people and we're managing the rest of the region at the same time. So, uh, that's where, and I know John alluded to it in his podcast, but we, we may be geographically separated into different regions within the state, but we often have people, um, within the different regions that are more than willing to come out and, and lend a helping hand. I think, I think you told me you, you got a big trip planned, right? Coming up here shortly. Is it, is it for work or is it for pleasure? Uh, I've got an overnighter planned here. Um, it's well, work and pleasure for me is, uh, that it's all intertwined. Uh, I'm, I'm, I absolutely love fishing and I'm a fisheries manager. So obviously there's plenty of overlap there. Um, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm going to do a, a float fishing trip on the North branch nice. and, uh, and see if we can tangle with a few trout. Um, but now I, I, coming off of a couple of trips up to Erie targeting walleyes on the, on the big lake and <laughs> having some fun there. And just as I mentioned earlier, we're kicking off uh, the fall pike season. So, mm -hmm. um, knocking the dust off the yeah what boat do you run i never asked you that like what is your rig that you're running right now uh my i have a um a lund rebel uh 16 okay it's a 16 and a half footer uh it's for big water for lake erie it, it's a little on the smaller side uh, certainly on the smaller side um I, I carefully watch the weather and and plan my trips around uh as best that i can but uh for 
for puddle jumping, so to speak, and you know, jumping around to all the different impoundments. The trailer's great. Uh, it's nice and deep. Mm -hmm. uh, my son and I put a lot of hours in it. Thirty-six volt, twenty-four volt. What are you running? I actually just have a twelve volt. A twelve and, volt, really? Um, yes. Uh, now, if, if I did more river fishing, move. I was on that thing. <laughs> yeah, I know. I it, it's almost it, it's almost embarrassing to say these days. It's like even twenty four volt. It's like, oh well, you know. Yeah, I would just be geez, scared how, that I'd run out of juice day. or something. That'd be my my fear. <sighs> Especially with spot lock now being such like I can't fish without it. I feel like a caveman if I don't have spot lock. I hear you. I hear you. And now that I'm new to iPilot and spot lock, uh, I had co-pilot co co right? prior to, okay, yeah, yeah. to, to iPilot and it, uh, certainly, yeah. Um, certainly has improved my, my fishing. Um, but I've run that thing hard and You'll really laugh when I tell you that I I still have the original battery sitting in it now. My I'm knocking God. on <laughs> knocking on wood because I bought the boat in 2018. It's it's uh, it was four years old in June, and I'm still running the original battery and just pounding it. How the I'm hell did you manage to get the one battery that worked? That I know, I know. I've been through ten, I think, in the last like six seven years. But yeah. I mean, I, I don't. Know. What brand are you using? Uh, Walmart specials or like something like lithiums? And, and again, you'll probably laugh at me because it's whatever the uh, <laughs> I, I bought it at Robbins Marine up in Milton, PA, up in Northern PA, and whatever they put in it is what's in it. Um, but it's blessed. It's cruising. You're freaking blessed. My goodness, it's cruising. I yeah, I, color me lucky, I guess. But uh, I think one thing that really helps is having an onboard charger mm -hmm. that runs the maintenance cycles, and when it's in the garage, it's it's plugged in constantly. So certainly that helps to extend battery life. But I've, I also know guys that have the onboard chargers that burn through batteries. Like every two or three years, they're putting a new battery in and some yeah. more frequent. Yeah. That, that would be me. That'd yeah. Be me. But I, I'm also so, running 36 volt system. So like that, that's the thing. That I fish a lot of rivers, uh, yeah. especially cause like, again, like spot lock, uh, you can go on like that Potomac here at big slack. I can hit spot lock and I can fish a boulder patch and I don't need to anchor anything. It's just there. But then again, like, yeah, you're sipping juice when you're doing something like that. Oh, and, and yeah, I mean, yesterday, uh, I've got some, some D pumps and rock piles and things marked that, uh, my son and I were, were, uh, we were trying to drop shot for some walleyes, but they weren't cooperating, but yeah, it's, it's so nice. You cruise up and hit the spot lock. 20 mm -hmm. feet upwind of it and using can optics or anything yet or you got hummingbirds what are you using nah um i'm running i'm <laughs> running lorance uh, <laughs> okay okay oh uh, everything has a price tag right yeah uh no my my next step is um probably going i don't have mega imaging even yet um i'm yeah uh, my next step is probably to go to a, a hummingbird helix probably a 10 okay. is what I've been looking at and get the mega imaging and, and then maybe have a, a second standalone. I dude, it's a money pit. I'm telling you, I know. Like, and that's honestly, that's the biggest thing about it is, you know, what's, what's more price, expensive what's price per pound yeah. for a walleye. What's, what's more expensive than fishing or bow hunting? Who <laughs> really fishing? Certainly now, not this year. Uh, I just bought a new bow this year. So, nice. um, and completely revamped my setup. So this year it, it, I, I probably dropped a little more into the bow hunting world, but I'm a buy quality gear, maintain it, keep it forever mm -hmm. kind of person. Uh, that's the first bow I bought in 15 years. Wow. Yeah. And sure. quite the technology jump. Uh, but with fishing, it's a constant just a constant turnover of baits yeah, and yeah. line and just the, the little stuff like that. And I can't, I'm walking around, like I mentioned to you, I'm glad you didn't have the cash register open there because <laughs> I'd probably get myself in trouble. But, um, I kind of, I have a thing where I, I never walk into a tackle shop and not walk out with the bait. Mm -hmm. And it, so in the price of baits, I mean, I, and I've, you start to fish some of the more expensive baits and you get used to how they fish and like the way they fish. And, you know, when you, you know, spending $16, $17 on a Lucky Craft. Or, it's, yeah. it can get up there. It really can, but it's, a, it's addictive. It really is. It's, mm -hmm. it, it's an addictive sport. Um, it's, it's a great way to be outside and enjoy it. And we have so many resources here, you know, in this greater area that, 
that people can take advantage of that they don't really know about. And these, these really upcoming fisheries, whether it's the pike, where they're hopefully like they're going to have a walleye fishery now too, in a couple of years. Um, it, it's, it's really cool. All the opportunities that are here and you guys are doing a great job with, with what you're given dealing with all of us crazy people that go out there and try to use these places. Nah, Hey, that's why, that's why we have a job is because of all the folks that go out there and want to enjoy those resources. And Hey, uh, that's it. I mean, that's, that's why we do what we do. And like, like I said, from day one and kind of my, my career aspiration from the day I started was that I want fishing to be better the day I leave than it was the day I started. And that's what it boils down to for me is I want to go out there. I'm going to collect the data that I need to understand these resources. And then with that data, be able to model different management scenarios and then most effectively manage these resources for the angler, because that's what it at the end mm -hmm. that's what it really boils down to for me so dude you're doing an amazing it. job um does matt sell everybody like what anything else that we need to touch on or anything you want me to link in the episode description that people can can find you no uh other than my contact info at the office uh you can find me there shoot me an email i'm always happy to talk to anglers so uh other than that if you catch a tag walleye do us a favor participate you, you know circling back to volunteerism uh some of the biggest things folks can do to volunteer and help us out and it may not be standing there actually conducting a krill survey, but if we come up to you and ask you to particip participate in a survey, or if you see a sign mm -hmm. that asks you to call in a tag, uh, do us a favor and do it. Um, because it's, I understand that everybody's time is valuable and especially time when you're either getting ready to get on the water and you want to get out there and start fishing or you're coming off the water, you're tired, you want to get home and get things put away. Um, usually we're not going to ask for more than five to seven minutes of your time. Uh, so if you, if you want to help, uh, that's, that's one big way that, that you can help as, as a volunteer is just volunteer to go ahead and participate whenever we approach you for that kind of stuff. And that's the data that we need to most effectively manage our fisheries. And that's, uh, so, um, if that's the first place to start that everybody can, can potentially help with is um yeah uh, help help us to learn about what our anglers are are doing out there and and what they think and what they're catching and what they're targeting and yeah so. matt thank you so much for coming on the show i really appreciate it you guys at the dnr have a free invite anytime you want to come on here talk about what's going on um from from your perspective in maryland guys please like and subscribe to the channel uh we right now are the, are the number one uh sports and outdoor podcast in the greater dmv area let's keep that up and until next time see you again on fishing the dmv bye you're listening to fishing the dmv with your hosts thomas aarons and jared mounts fishing the dmv is brought to you by jake's bait and tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.